I hope uh, everyone's found the, the previous two panels uh, informative. I certainly have. And um, we're now going to move on to panel number three, Restoring the Family. And I will um, introduce the panelists. Um, the moderator is Kay Heimowitz, the uh, William E. Simon Fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a contributing editor to City Journal. Um, Kay writes extensively on childhood, family issues, poverty, and cultural change in America. She's the author of four books, including Marriage and Caste in America, Separate and Unequal Families in a Postmarital Age, and Liberation's Children, Parents and Kids in a Postmodern Age. Uh, and again, Kay will be moderating the panel. The panelists are, uh, I'll start with Ron Haskins, a senior fellow in the Economic Studies Program at the Brookings Institution and a senior consultant at the Annie E. Casey Foundation in Baltimore. Um, in 2002, Mr. Haskins was the senior advisor to the president for welfare reform policy at the White House. Um, uh, he is a senior editor of The Future of Children, a journal on policy issues that affect children and families. He's also, also the author of Show Me the Evidence, uh, Work Over Welfare, the Inside Story of the 1996 Welfare Reform, and a co-author of Creating an Opportunity Society. Um, next panelist I will introduce is Robert Woodson. Uh, the founder and president of the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise, uh, which since 1981 has provided training for more than 2,600 leaders and community-based groups in 39 states. Um, Mr. Woodson is also the author of Youth Crime and Urban Policy, A View from the Inner City, and The Triumphs of Joseph, How Today's Community Healers Are Reviving our streets and neighborhoods. And finally, I wanted to introduce Glenn Lowry, a professor of economics at Brown University. Uh, Mr. Lowry has also taught at Boston University, Harvard, and Northwestern. Um, he's the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and a Carnegie Scholarship. Uh, he's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and uh, the author of several books, including one by one from the inside out, essays and reviews on race and responsibility in America, and race, incarceration, and American values, which was put out in 2008. On a personal note, I'd, I'd like to say that both uh, Professor Lowry and Bob Woodson, uh, more than they could possibly realize, have influenced uh, my thinking on many of the issues we're talking about today over the years. I discovered both of their writings when I was in college, um, never thought I would be here today sharing a, a stage with them, but uh, just simply devoured their work uh, in the early 90s, their essays, their magazine articles, their newspaper columns, and their books. And it is quite a privilege for me to, um, to have them here today. And I want to say thank you to both of them for, for participating in this. And with that, I will turn things over to, uh, to Kay Heimowitz. Thanks, and welcome to what seems to be the third panel on the family. Um, for those of you who were here earlier, you'll know what I mean. Um, I'm very pleased to be here because I've done a lot of work on the Moynihan Report, and it's such an important moment in American history, uh, really a kind of hinge moment, not only because Moynihan recognized what, what was going on before anybody else in the black family but also because of its aftermath, that is the public response to the Moynihan Report. Um, when the, when uh, Moynihan first wrote the report, he actually got a fairly good response from within the administration. Uh, Bill Moyers, who was a senior staff with uh, Lyndon Johnson, was very, very uh, excited about it. Yes, that Bill Moyers. <laughs> Um, and uh, Johnson himself was so uh, taken with the report that he gave a speech um, very close to here at, uh, at Howard University for the graduation of the, the graduating class in 1965 
Uh, and he said the following, this is, uh, it's so incredible to hear these words and to imagine a sitting president uttering them, but he said, uh, the next and more profound stage of the battle for civil rights is the family. Negro poverty is not white poverty. The breakdown of the Negro family structure uh, is the consequence of ancient brutality, past injustice, and present prejudice. But when the family collapses, it is the children that are usually damaged. When it happens on a massive scale, the community itself is crippled. Now, uh, let me put it this way. Oh, he, well, when Johnson gave that speech shortly after, he said he believed it was his greatest civil rights speech. But to put it bluntly, uh, not many people agreed. Um, there was tremendous upheaval, tremendous pushback uh, from a lot of civil rights organizations and ultimately a lot of feminist groups as well. Um, so much so that Moynihan was basically kind of pushed out of Washington. Uh, and Johnson went silent on, on this subject. One response uh, that I wanted to read to you from, uh, was from a, an activist and author named Joyce Ladner, who interestingly enough, became president of Howard University some years later. This is what she said, uh, wrote in response to the Moynihan Report. Uh, One must question the validity of the white middle class lifestyle from its very foundation because it has already proven itself to be decadent and unworthy of emulation. Um, and uh, you, get, you get a sense of some of the tenor of the response here and why this conversation went so um, uh, underground. And in fact, Ladner's view really prevailed for a very long time, although people didn't always put it in quite those ways. Um, today, the conversation about the black family has actually improved quite a bit um, for, for this reason. In around the early 90s into the mid 90s, there started to be an, uh, more and more research show, showing that children of single mothers really were at a disadvantage. Um, there was enough uh, data at that point over uh, a decade or, or over several le- decades to see these trends and to um, uh, develop enough research that, um, and I'm going to be quoting our old friend, uh, the late James Q. Wilson here, even sociologists had to believe it. So he, um, uh, you know, at that point, I think there was at least in academia a sense that, well, yes, at least, well, I should say at least among some family researchers, yes, there was a problem here, a genuine problem. But although the uh, conversation has been somewhat improved, uh, it is still in many ways very uh, reminiscent of that early uh, debate that we had between Moynihan and his critics. Um, And um, I'm hoping that our panel today, I know our panel today, our very excellent panel, uh, will have some interesting ways of thinking about that debate. Uh, and hopefully even have some uh, solutions to, uh, to this problem that continues to be uh, so much part of our uh, American discussion today. So I'm going to begin with um, Ron Haskins, who will lay out some of the numbers for you on where we're at. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm a great admirer of the Moynihan Report. I remember read it all the way. Back in 1965, of course, I was young then. I was just learning to read. But uh, I read the thing, and I was astounded (laughs) by it. And I was way more astounded by the reaction to it, which was shocking, uh, as Kay has said. So my job is to just lay out some numbers about what our situation is. Recall that Moynihan was complaining primarily about black families. And his thesis was really that because of weakness in black family structure, blacks would not be able to seize the opportunities that were coming available to them as a result of the civil rights movement. Uh, And I can tell you that what I'm going to say to you is Moynihan's concerns now apply to Hispanics and to whites, to the whole country. And here are the numbers. I got these by, I recently analyzed the 1970, 80, 90, 2000, 2010 uh, decennial censuses. So this is representative of the whole country. Uh, And here's what happened uh, with family composition. So first, marriage rates. Marriage rates declined for every age group, for every ethnic group, uh, for every education group, all with one exception, 
that's quite fascinating. They declined 1970 and 1980 for college educated women, but they have been stable and even risen a little bit for college educated women. I think there's a lesson in that. But for every other group, uh, it, uh, uh, marriage rates have declined. And now I'm going to tell you a fact that's demonstrated by social science that will, this fact will make it worthwhile that you came here today. <laughs> Sex did not go out of fashion even though marriage did. <laughs> and when those two things happen, you have lots of non-marital births. And this was really the problem that Moynihan focused on the most. And now we have uh, non-marital birth rate among Hispanics and whites are higher than they were when Moynihan wrote the report and their level among blacks back in 1965. So today, 72% uh, uh, of black kids are born out of, uh, out of wedlock, 53% uh, of Hispanic kids and 36% of white kids. The overall non-marital birth rate in the United States is well over 40%. So now, if we put these marriage rates and birth rates together, and let's describe the change in the family constitution of females at age 35. This is a nice way to summarize what has happened. So in the last 40 years, the married with children, that category, which is the one that I'm always the most concerned about because we're worried about kids, has fallen from 78% to 51%. That's a 35% decline in the percentage of women who are living, who have had children and lived with their children uh, at, um, uh, since 1970. And then single with children, as you would expect, has exploded. It's more than doubled from 9.3% of all children to 20.5% of all children. And these figures at any given moment, so over a period of time, the figures are even, even higher. So this really constitutes a revolution. And the next question to ask that the rest of the panel, I believe, will answer, and I'm just going to give one hint about it, and that is, so what? So what? And the answer is that, first of all, kids who live in single-parent, female-headed families are five times as likely to be poor as kids in married couple families. And they're very uh, prone to ups and downs in the economy, and the family's prone to up, ups and downs. So no one thinks poverty is good for kids. So right there, you get a hint about what, uh, what the the next thing I'm going to talk about, Kay already mentioned it, which is research on single parent families and married couple families. Bear in mind that when this research started, the professoriate was totally convinced that it made no difference. Mavis Hetherington, one of the most famous developmental psychologists and one of the original students of marriage, came to the conclusion that the kids will be all right, it'll bother them for a while, but they'll go on and they'll be fine. Now we know based on literally hundreds of studies, and they're accumulating all the time. Uh, and this is, uh, um, I mentioned again, this is primarily professors doing this work, including uh, uh, Wilson sociologists, the most famous one of which is, uh, is uh, um, uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah, McClanahan. Sarah McClanahan, yeah, good memory. Um, Sarah McClanahan, who really wrote the original book and has written several things since then, including the best studies of the impacts being causal, that kids have a lot of trouble when they're reared in female-headed families. So the fact is that Moynihan was right when he wrote. Now he's three times more correct because his conclusions apply to Hispanics and whites as well as blacks. We are in for serious trouble. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Glenn Lowry is going to speak next. Unfortunately, the facts don't really matter that much. Uh, that comment that you quoted, Kay, of James Q. Wilson about even a sociologist could believe it is indicative, I think, of uh, something that's really important about the state of our political slash intellectual lives uh, here in this country. Um, facts don't govern. Narratives govern. Mm -hmm. This is about the story that we tell. The conflict over the control of the narrative has taken precedence over a, if you will, evidence-based and rational implementation of policy. And when you throw race into the mix, it just gets tough. Okay? I can give many examples, and not only in the debate about the family and family structure. Of course, Moynihan was right. 
He was right in 1965 about the condition of the African-American family and how it had been changing. He was right about the implication that Ron Haskins has mentioned to the effect that the consequence of this social transformation amongst African-Americans would make their, our embrace of the newly uh, opened opportunities uh, more difficult. Um, he was right to the extent that he insinuated that this was a matter not only of the African-American social landscape, but a matter of importance to the, to the nation as a whole. Of course he was right about that. Um, those who had the hunch, Moynihan was not really a social scientist, come on. But, <laughs> but uh, he was a very effective policy intellectual who had uh, some interesting things to say, and he had a hunch. Uh, those who had the hunch that the unraveling of the traditional family spelled real trouble for our society uh, have been shown to be right. Now, I just want to make a couple of points about this. So what is it has consequences, but then what do we do, okay? Cultural engineering is, is not a exact science. It's not something that I would want to bet my life on. You can pull on the string and unravel the fabric <coughs> of a uh, social institution, but reweaving that fabric, going back in the other direction, is a, is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, the tools that the state has available, our welfare and assistance policies, our tax policies and so on, are very, very crude. And one is pushing against uh, a zeitgeist uh, that has moved very far from the 1950s, restoring the traditional family. I mean, I saw the title, and with respect to organizers, I almost laughed, because it is such a futile objective. Traditional family? I have a dear friend. His name is David Blankenhorn. He runs an institution in New York City called the Institute for American Values. He's a good man. He wrote a book, I don't know, 25 years or more ago called Fatherless America, in which he was lamenting the denigration of the role of fatherhood within American uh, culture. And David uh, has embraced gay marriage, and I don't criticize him for having done so, not in the least. My son is a gay man, for that matter. But he's done so in part out of the desperate need to find allies in defense of marriage per se. Part of his motivation is simply they're for marriage, I'm for them. I'm, I mean, I'm looking for allies for marriage, and I don't, I don't see that many of them around. <laughs> Now, it would be easy to get ideological here, to start wagging my finger at the left-wing feminist who wanted to destroy the family and so forth and so on, and I don't want to do that because I don't want to, I don't want to lose the, um, the weight of what I'm trying to say about intellectual, uh, uh, political intellectual difficulty that we wandered into uh, amidst partisanship, because as soon as I say that, everyone will run to their respective corners and put up their defenses. But, you know, uh, Pat Moynihan, and Pat Moynihan was a friend of mine, uh, I knew uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Uh, I was in the audience in 1985, that would be 30 years ago, when he came to the Kennedy School at Harvard and gave the Godkin Lectures, which were later published as his book, Family and Nation, in which he tried to do the impossible, defend his own intellectual contribution, and at the same time, <laughs> and at the same time uh, uh, defend the uh, political program of the Democratic Party. <laughs> he, did, he, he, he took a real shot at it. Okay? He, he, um, but it wasn't only family matters. Defining deviancy down, anybody remember that? This was also Pat Moynihan. The character of our intellectual discourse, our ability to be honest with each other, to call a spade a spade, one might say, uh, with trepidation. Look at the discourse that's going on now in the aftermath of Ferguson and Baltimore and so forth. People are writing on the op-ed pages of serious newspapers that if there hadn't been a riot, there wouldn't have been justice. Without any sense of self-consciousness or irony right. that, you mean that's the way we get justice through riots? Is that justice? Okay. People are saying uh, that, uh, uh, as has been mentioned here, I think Jason actually mentioned it, are saying that um, the uh, very evocation of cultural argument is already a betrayal mm -hmm. of equality. Uh, in the country. We can't even talk about it. I don't want this to just be a lament, so I'm going to conclude my little remarks here with a suggestion. We desperately need leadership here. Someone has got to push against the prevailing tide. 
Somebody has got to have the courage to say something, even though they know that 95%, my friend John McWhorter says, if you go and try and tell black intellectuals and opinion writers, let's restore the black family, maybe you'll get two out of 10, maybe you'll get three out of 10 to agree, and if they write that in the op-ed, they'll be snowed under by an avalanche of reaction and so forth and so on. They gotta write it anyway. The President of the United States has to say it anyway. When the President of the United States is the first African American to hold the most powerful office in the land, he's got to say it anyway. I voted twice for Barack Obama. I mean him no disrespect. I intend him no ill will. But I'm so deeply disappointed that the events that have transpired in the last six months have not called forth from him the kind of counter-cultural leadership. When I say counter-cultural, I mean against the prevailing zeitgeist that wants to account for all of these matters in terms of absent opportunity, tacit racism, psychological impairment of police officers. There is absent opportunity. There's plenty of racism out there, and some police need to be worked on. But at the root here is a failure, now a half century ongoing, of uh, African American society to be able to respond effectively to the opportunities out there. You're not supposed to say this. People get on leaky boats and risk their lives to get here from every continent on the planet. And by and large, once they get off those boats, they do pretty well. I think the system, with its flaws, is working pretty well. I think it's unavoidable, the question, you people, what's up? Okay? And that's a question that we people should be asking first and foremost of ourselves. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Robert Woodson. Yeah, I would like to speak to this from the perspective of a social activist that spends most of my time in low-income neighborhoods. I affectionately say 80% of my closest friends are ex-something. <laughs> <laughs> but not ex-friends. <laughs> no. They're ex-drug addicts, they're ex-prostitutes, they're ex-something. And I think that, uh, and, and when I was active in the civil rights movement, uh, I'm probably one of the few people that when Dr. King died, I, was, uh, I hit the streets with 10 neighborhood leaders and interposed ourselves between the National Guard and the police and the rioters. And the reason that we could prevail is because the people I was with was respected and known by the people. Not a single civil rights person, not a single pastor was there but they were grassroots leaders and they represented what I call community antibodies. That the sickest part of the body draws the healthiest antibodies. But we only call upon them in times of crisis. These are the legitimate leaders of low income people. It was after that that I realized that a, a lot of people who suffered and sacrificed most in the struggle for civil rights did not benefit from the change. The civil rights movement was about well-educated people. The, the, and so that's why uh, Bill Raspberry, when he was a reporter for the Post, uh, I think it was Oc October 31st, 1965, a banner headline, poor Negroes are not benefiting from the gains of the civil rights movement. And the same kind of anger that you heard in uh, Baltimore was echoed 50 years ago mm -hmm. by low-income blacks then because the, the interests and, and, and poor blacks were caught into a bait and switch game where they used the, the demographics of those at the bottom. And when the remedies and the money arrived, it didn't go to them, it went to those that provided services to the poor. And so we are in serious need of, of some self-examination inside the black community. That's why I'm calling for a one year moratorium and whining about white folks. <laughs> I'm going to absolve you all for a year. <laughs> the, the, high, the high council of black leadership gave me the authority to absolve all white people for a year. <laughs> <laughs> this gives us an opportunity to address the enemy within. The enemy within means that we need to stop pimping poor people. And so, and what does that mean? That means that we have to apply old values to, uh, um, a, new, old values to a new vision. <laughs> yes, the family's disintegrating, but it didn't happen uh, the, the, if it wasn't racism and it wasn't poverty, because if that's true, 
during the 10 years of the Depression, Glenn, wouldn't, shouldn't, wouldn't the black family have been disintegrated? It didn't. Our marriage formation rights was higher than it was in the, in the white community. Even though the overall unemployment rate was 25%, was 40% for the black community, we still didn't disintegrate because we had a value system that held us together until, 19, in, until the 60s. And that's when it, I don't want to take the time to talk about how that happened with Cloward and Piven and others who began to, uh, 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 they wanted to disconnect work from income and, and welfare became a right. We become to moral deregulation occurred and where under John Lindsay, we just, and, and the governments just opened up offices that recruited people of welfare. So the biggest spike in welfare was at a time when the black unemployment rate for black men in New York was 4%. And so it just it went out of control. But they, and they said, if we disconnect work from income, families will disintegrate, men will leave, dropout rates will occur. What we'll do is just flood the system with these poor people it will then compel America to engage in income redistribution, and that's the, the answer to poverty. That's how this family went off the cliff that we're on. Okay, but what are remedies? The remedies are, uh, and, and, and my, my, my criticism of both scholars to the left and right, we talk about the 70% of the black families that are dysfunctional. That means 30% uh, are functioning. So why don't we do studies of capacities among the 30% to try to find out what is going on in those households that can perhaps give us some idea of what are the coping mm -hmm. mechanisms and how can win. That's what the center does. Uh, for 10 years in public housing, Kenilworth Parkside right here in the 80s, the women and, and mothers there said that our, 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 our housing is horrible, but we have to change it. So the residents, the mothers got together and began to organize a management of public housing. Kimmy Gray, who two streets are named from this leader, she was abandoned by her husband at age 21 with five children and divorced. She got off welfare in three years, sent all five kids to college, and in 10 years enabled 400 other kids from this one public housing project to go on to college. Uh, teen pregnancy rates were just about down, almost eliminated. And, and it was on 60 Minutes. We had a lot of, everyone came to examine this success except researchers, <laughs> except policymakers. And there are other examples where there are, uh, are people taking responsibility who operate mediating institutions. No, we're not going to be, put, replace them, Glenn, but what there are alternatives, though, that can help young people Coaches are, a, 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 are substitute fathers. We have a lot of ex-offenders whose lives have been transformed and redeemed who are now coaches and the surrogate fathers for kids. So we've got to come up with alternative ways. But, the, but my, my, my point is we need to stop studying failure. You learn nothing from studying failure except how to create failure. I said Ron and some of the other scholars, we, we, we keep, we, they almost read like autopsy reports. <laughs> we really need to do capacity studies and that's what we do, uh, is you have to go into low income communities, find out who is working, how is working, how can we begin to take some of the money that are going into people who, uh, who, are, who, are, in, who are professional service providers that, that parachute in remedies Instead, we should take some of that money, give it to the people that are indigenous to those communities who have come up with innovative approaches. They are the social entrepreneurs. And like in any entrepreneurs, only 3% of commercial entrepreneurs create 70% of the jobs. And so therefore, it only takes a minority of people in these communities to create innovative solutions that can be applied to the whole community. We just need to um, begin to study success. Thank you. <clears throat> so it strikes me that um, we're having a discussion I've heard before, um, although very eloquently uh, expressed. Um, and I'm wondering, I, I have a feeling that all of you are feeling that same sense of deja vu. <laughs> you referred to it 
uh, when we were talking before, Glenn, that mm -hmm. this, uh, you've been doing this a long time and right. hearing the same stuff. So um, let's push a little bit and think a little bit more about is there any, are there any new ideas out there? Uh, as Ron um, and, and perhaps both, all three of you know, the uh, government programs that uh, started under the Bush administration for promoting marriage were not successful or very disappointing. Um, and uh, certainly when it comes to um, government initiated programs, it, it's not clear what we have other than some, maybe some tinkering with the tax code to reduce the tax uh, disadvantage for married couples. But um, you know, I'm for one very skeptical about that. Anyway, I just wanna push a little bit more to think what, what is new out there? What more can we be thinking about? So, I'm a little skeptical too, I admit that, uh, but I just, I completely disagree with Bob. I'm on Bob's board, maybe for about another 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, social science is about looking for successes. We have literally hundreds of important random assignment experiments to find out what works, and we have found out some things that do work. Now, if you're expecting that we're going to launch a program and we're going to increase the high school graduation rate by 80%, that's not gonna happen. That hap may happen over a period of years. But we've got programs like Small Schools of Choice in New York City, a huge experiment, random assignment, to well, it's close to random assignment, and it shows that you can increase graduation rates in the most disadvantaged neighborhoods uh, in New York, and that a disproportionate number of those kids go to college. Bob, that's positive. That's a positive Ron, outcome. Let me, let me interrupt you for a minute. What about with the family? We do know that there are schools that work, and what, what happens okay, when we talk about the family? Okay, you want to concentrate just on family. The only thing that I think we could really say with confidence that we know is that we could reduce non-marital births. We have very good programs that have shown that. They're cost beneficial. They're controversial. Republicans are very likely to oppose them. They're having a huge battle in Colorado right now. Why don't you explain what you're yeah. referring to here? I'm, okay, the, I think the, there's a lot of controversy here, and I think it's because many of the organizations that are involved with family planning are also involved with abortion, and that raises a red flag for Republicans. But to be concrete about the situation, in Colorado, uh, one of the uh, uh, philanthropists gave the state a lot of money to launch something called a LARC, which is a long-acting reversible uh, contraception. And they did it almost statewide. They had control counties. It was pretty good social science. And they showed a big reduction. Of, well, first of all, the mothers themselves, the women themselves, some of whom are mothers, actually chose LARCs as their preferred form of birth control because it doesn't rely on memory. The, they get a LARC, a, a, a IUD is the most popular kind, and it lasts for up to 10 years. They don't have to worry about it. Uh, second thing, it, of course, it, it also reduced the birth rate, and then, most interesting of all, it substantially reduced the abortion rate. So you would think Republicans would support this, but no, the legislature is going to let the program die. They will not support the program. Let's get some feedback you then know, from... See, uh, you know, what, what really <laughs> bothers me is that you, uh, in a book, was it, it was James um, C. Scott talks about thinking like a state. Well, he talks the difference, the difference in, in, in um, uh, or, or practical knowledge and theoretical knowledge. See, you, you require that what grassroots people do is fit your model of understanding how to evaluate things. And he describes it like theoretical knowledge that you can generalize is like a ship captain steering a ship across an ocean. You can generalize about it and everyone can apply it. But when that ship captain gets to the, the port of Baltimore, he or she turns that ship over to a harbor master because the harbor master has practical knowledge about how to take that ship in and out of port. The harbor master's skill here is like what grassroots people do. They are expert because of common knowledge about how to steer that ship all these principles in that environment. You could not take that same harbor master to Detroit or, or to some other seacoast in port. So, uh, so we need new ways of evaluating these kind of interventions. And in our market economy, it only takes, uh, uh, in every other way uh, uh, in our sphere, if a doctor finds that 
uh, operating on a frog and you put it back into the vat and, and, the, and, the heal, and the wound heals in the presence of the bacteria, we say it's counterproductive. It's on the front page of the, of the newspapers. Well, if people are able to bring about the restoration and recovery of families in a given community that has 100, they're restored, why don't we rush there to find what are the implications for taking it uh, to scale? But you dismiss it, and that's the problem. The, the, the principles that operate in our market economy, we just ignore them when it comes to the social economy. Instead, we say, well, unless what you're doing fits our model of evaluation that we can have 20% of the, of the people doing it here and 20 more, you're forcing innovation that is based upon common sense practice of people to fit your model of evaluation. Otherwise, it's not legitimate, and therefore it doesn't get funded. Uh, I would put aside your response to that for just one second while we ask if Glenn has any, anything to add to well, this I just discussion. Well, I, I think this is a very interesting exchange. And as a social scientist, I'm a professor of economics. Um, it, it interests me greatly. Uh, because, of course, random assignment uh, assessments of various policy initiatives has become the gold standard for figuring out, quote, what works, close quote. And this, this is epistemology, people, yeah, from Philosophy 101. <laughs> and, and this observation that there are other kinds of knowledge, okay, is, is, I, is I find very interesting. But I just want to say, but I, I want to say something else. Another argument for the mediating structures um, uh, idea that uh, Bob is uh, trumpeting here is that it can rely on sources of, th of authority that are not available to government. That's right. Religious authority, for example. It can speak to people in terms of what are we called by our God, however we understand that, to do. What does it mean to be a good person in a full-throated way, not in an abstract way, in a way that ties into narratives that are millennial in their uh, overhang of uh, human culture. And that's just not something that the state can do. So now if I ask a kid, why didn't you steal that candy bar? The kid walks by and he doesn't steal the candy bar. He can give me two different kind of answers. One has to do with what the state will do to him if he steals the candy bar. I might get caught, I might get punished. Another has to do with him not being a thief. I'm not a thief. Our people don't steal. Now, where would that idea come from? Who are our people? How do you instill in somebody that sense of self? That's calling on a different kind of authority. Now, if it's not there, it's not there. And maybe what that means is the movement needs to be a movement of people who can get there. By there, I mean to the place where they can authoritatively say to somebody in a way that makes a difference, that's not who you are. This is who you are. Mm -hmm. And I think Glenn, Glenn uh, I think, eloquently descri describes it because I can take you to an area 20 years ago they were, there were 53 murders in a five-square block area because of these warring factions. The police couldn't stop it, but we organized. We had five grassroots leaders who had the respect of those kids. They brought the leaders to my office. We negotiated a truce. And, and as a result, the, uh, and they went back to, to rebuild that community paid by the government housing authority. And, and so what we did was we didn't have a gang-related murder for 12 years. And so we took the principles that we found and exported them to other, other places. But again, it was, and what we've learned from that, if you have a, a situation where there are 1,000 kids that are controlled by 10%, and if you come in and change the values and, 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 and authority structures, they then become a catalyst for changing the 90%, and that's why we've been able to institute. So what I'm saying to you is that there has to be 60% uh, uh, of, of Apple's income comes from a product that didn't exist six years ago. Why can't we apply the same level of imagination to social intervention? So have you seen any kind of um, interventions in relation to the family that you would want to tell us about? Absolutely. Um, people like myself. My dad died when I was uh, seven, leaving my mother, who was a, a domestic with a fifth grade education, to raise five kids in uh, a very troubled neighborhood. What I had to rely upon then are my fellows, a group of men that I went around with who were my, you may call it a gang, we weren't predatory. 
but they became a surrogate uh, family for me and enabled me to, uh, to, to progress to, my, to I was 18 and went into the military. So there are other structures in these communities that serve to substitute for families, sometimes coaches. I know my coach, I don't know my English teacher. So we've got to come up with, and Paul Ryan's the same. His dad died when he was a, uh, a young. So, but we've got to identify structures within those communities. If you were to ask me to select my blood family or my fellows, I tell you my fellows, because my family couldn't get me to school safely. They, in other words, we've got to appreciate that these in other alternative structures can be as important to an urban youth as his blood family. And we need to provide support for those institutions that provide a positive alternative to families. Let me, uh, oh, wait a minute. Hold yeah, on. Get, so, yeah you, do. Time you here. do. So I'm going to give some <laughs> advice to Glenn. Sir. Because I'm exactly where Glenn is. You wouldn't know this by the exchange with Bob because Bob is so hostile against social science. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I completely agree with Bob. I think there's a huge place for the community. I would always go with the community. In fact, the first thing we would try to do is get support from the community. Uh, so I don't have any problem with that. But what I do, where I absolutely draw the line, is I have heard, rarely hear anybody as effective as Bob is, but I hear these claims from people all over the country all the time. We got a letter from a constituent that saved their child, and they say, spend another billion on this or another billion on that. And when you do a good study, it didn't make any difference on average. Averages are the key. We have, if you're going to move something, you've got to move averages. Bob, you get better used to evaluation because the government is going to insist on accountability and that the things that we undertake and pay for, that you can show that they work not with anecdotes and not with emotion, but with data. Okay, let me just say to you, Baylor University came in and studied our violence-free zone program that's been operating for nine years in the Milwaukee school system. They did the kind of study, and, they, uh, and it's been accepted for academic review. I know that turns people on. Um, <laughs> Bob, you're not being sarcastic. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, no, me? Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. It's so constructive See, to be sarcastic. <laughs> But anyway, it's been accepted for academic review. Uh, so no, we're not against it. All we're asking you is to take the time to come and study the things that work instead of the things that are being authored by other academics. Okay. That's all. Right. all. I'm gonna, so um, I'm not against evaluation, but study the right what thing. What was the advice? You, you said you it's had advice be for both. me. It's going to be both. Oh, both. Okay. You have to figure out a way to integrate what Bob's talking about with accountability and good studies. Yeah, but all I'm all saying right. to you, I, I have endless examples that we have presented. 60 Minutes can find it. CBS can find it. The newspapers can find it. But social scientists can't. And all we're right. saying just come <laughs> where the solutions are. Right. Use your skill to evaluate now what people have Now, you guys have, have to behave here. So um, <laughs> I want to turn. <laughs> You've been perfectly yeah, fine. Strong memo will okay. follow. <laughs> so so um, I'm going to turn the uh, questions to you now. And we're, hopefully, they will not be about social science. <laughs> um, so we're, let's see. What have we got over here? Uh, Professor Lowry uh, put the question uh, extremely bluntly. Uh, you pointed out people come here from pretty much all over the world. They seem to do pretty well. And uh, so what's up with you people? And I gather the question here, you people, meant what's up with black people? Now, there are some people who have looked into that question pretty seriously and have concluded, as Charles Murray or Linda Gottfriedson or Richard Lynn, many others, that. What's up with black people is partially, at least, uh, heritable genetic traits. Now, is that something that we should be looking into and thinking about or talking about, or is that just unspeakably taboo? OK, so my answer has two parts. One has to do with whether we should look, and then the other has to do with what we have found. <laughs> we should look. Okay, The prohibition on inquiry in that area, in my mind, is uh, a, a, a um, species of anti-intellectualism mm -hmm. that is uh, anathema to modernity. That is to say, a bunch of people saying, you can't ask that question. That's such a bad question to ask, you can't ask it. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so I really don't think I want to live in a society in which 
uh, political mobilizations prevent inquiry into relevant substantive mm -hmm. matters that are important. Um, my, uh, the second part of my answer, though, has to do with what we find. Now, I don't agree with Linda Godfordson, and I don't agree with Charles Murray and Richard Herrnstein of the bell curve. I've read the bell curve. In fact, I was, I was uh, on leave uh, for a couple of months in India when the bell curve came out and got a bad case of dysentery <laughs> and didn't have much else to do but to read the bell curve. <laughs> And I've read all the appendices. And what I want you to know, sir, is that they can't snow me with regression analysis and statistical manipulation. I'm a fellow of the Econometric Society. There wasn't anything in there that I didn't understand. Uh, my conclusion upon reading the bell curve was that the case wasn't established, the case being that um, inherited differences in intellectual capacity between people of African and of European descent are of such a nature that social interventions aimed at promoting greater uh, racial equality were uh, futile, that you wouldn't be able to move the needle that way. Um, I, amongst the many critical reviews of the bell curve, and there were many in the social psychology literature, in the economics and sociology and political science literatures, I remember one very well. Um, the, um, I think it was Arthur Goldberger, I could be wrong about this, an econometrician at the University of Wisconsin who made the following observation. He said, the issue here is not whether or not I can account for a certain proportion of the variance in some outcome, like income, earnings, or whatever, by reference to variation in genetic endowment. The issue is whether or not amongst the various things that I can actually move, I can invest in education, I can perhaps change employment opportunities, I can do other things of that nature, the effect on the thing that we care about will be uh, significant or it will not be. And we can't move, I mean, I, you know, uh, it's not a policy variable here. I guess I'm saying two different kinds of things. One is, um, I'm not persuaded by the evidence as summarized in that literature that the claim uh, about uh, the importance of racial differences and in intellectual ability uh, is true. I don't believe that claim. But I'm also saying that we have uh, many other instruments that we could employ in order to intervene in people's lives uh, that could be effective so that we don't even need to get to that. Right. Yeah. Good, good uh, John McWhorter has a question. Um, Bob, this is a question for you and I guess also for Ron. I wrote a piece under the aegis of the Manhattan Institute um, some years ago where I charged African American studies departments and by association professors of fields related to that to let go of the idea that the proper thing to study was failure. I questioned why it seemed to be so unthinkable that you also study academically success in order to identify what would help the black community as opposed to chronicling the failure. And the response to this actually rather surprised me. That notion was like science fiction to my critics. The idea that an academic pursuit would be to study how people have triumphed over institutional racism. And what a lot of the criticism was, it, it's interesting, you never know what people are gonna come up with. This is how that came off to a lot of black graduate students and frankly minor league academics, but still. For me to write those columns implied that I'm a snob. They thought that what I was saying was, why can't people study how to become someone like me? And so they thought, that's a bad idea because you're supposed to be studying ordinary black people. And I think that that's an internalization of a low self-image for predictable reasons, but that's what they thought. It would be snobbish to study success. How would you respond to that? Because that's the response of many social scientists to the idea of studying how one triumphs over institutional racism. Okay, let me tell you this. That's the people that you talk to presume to speak for black people, <laughs> okay? The moment you take it to black people, like I did one night on, on black, it was a Sheridan broadcast that went out to 12 states, all black news station then. And the same, I had a moderator and a guest in the studio who was taking the same position, attacking me for this and that. 
But when the phones opened up, <laughs> the comments were seven to one in support of what I was saying. And so what, I, my, so I, what we've got to do is allow the people in whose name they say they speak to speak for themselves, and they will just undermine the authority of these people. Because it happens, I've had it endless times. Of course, I don't get invited on anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but I can tell you, uh, uh, John, when you, take, when, you, when you sit before an audience of ordinary black folks, and I've done all the time, it, it, they, they have a different perspective than the people at these black studies programs. So I, I, I would suggest that, just like I was on with uh, five black mayors, and they said, well, Bob, what's, where do you get these ideas? I said, from your constituents. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, you know what I challenged them to do? And maybe you should do this sometime with them. I said, I tell you what, Mr. Ma Mayors, why don't we debate these issues in any public housing project in your district, the two of us, and let's see what the people in public housing have to say about your views versus mine. See, when you set up a situation where you change the venue where these ideas are being discussed out of the university and out of narrow-minded students who are pampered, but you take them to in the community, say, let's just take this venue and shift it and discuss this in front of the people and see what they say. Ron, That's what you've got to do. Ron, did you want to no. say anything? Didn't you have a question for Ron as well? Well, the idea being whether Ron, you have any sense of what I mean about that particular attitude among social scientists that one should this not study. Because it seems like we need to just change. This moderator on the show, he had to change. Well, I. I don't, I'm not sure, you're right, I don't understand what you mean with that last point. Uh, I think I understood pretty well what Bob was saying, he made it pretty clear. Uh, <laughs> I don't detect anything like that in social scientists. Social scientists are looking for solutions, they're willing to study anything, uh, they're willing to be controversial. Uh, some of them are not cautious, you know, they have the same flaws that anybody else does, but I think that if, if they thought that something might be a solution to education, to family, to whatever, they would be more than willing to study it. In fact, they try to get a grant to do it and make their name on it. Don't you think that's right? Yeah, I think that's basically right. I mean, I, I think, however, that universities as institutions are um, less open uh, to free inquiry than they might be. Uh, I don't think that's statutory. It's not that there's a law or rule against it. I think it's customary. I think there's a lot of social pressures. Uh, to that effect, but I don't think that extends to the community of social scientists taken as a whole. Uh, so I, I did not say one syllable to defend universities. Think tanks are another matter, but not, right? What? <laughs> I said think tanks are another matter. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll say this, at least think tanks tell you where they are, it's and they're true. willing to have ferocious arguments with each other, which is, that's the American way, right? And universities appear not to be that way. Okay, can I just say one more thing sure. in response to the IQ question, which is, we now know from very careful study about schools, so we're gonna get all the panels, we're gonna get crime, we're gonna get education, we're gonna get the family. We know that there are uh, ways of improving the performance in schools of uh, disadvantaged kids uh, through the charter movement and others. I mean, this fellow Roland Fryer, the economist at Harvard, who happens to have been a student of mine, just won the John Bates Clark Medal in Economics. It's the most prestigious prize in the discipline, short of the Nobel Prize. Uh, he is a, a very impressive 36-year-old uh, Harvard uh, economist, and he spent his, the last 15 years uh, studying uh, what makes the Harlem Children's Zone work, what makes the KIPP Academies work, can we go to Houston and uh, reorder the way they're doing uh, education in those schools and with random assignment and very careful statistical measurement ascertain whether or not things are getting better. There is a problem with cognitive ability. This is what I wanted to concede. I don't think it's an IQ issue. There is a problem with the intellectual development and the intellectual functioning of people that impairs their employment opportunities and probably has other consequences, but it's not in their genes, I believe. It's in their the socialization and institutional uh, processes of education, and I think we can, through social science, learn more about how to make that function better. 
Can, Let's can see I if we, see well, we I want to make seconds. sure, 30 seconds, but we do have more questions. Okay, so the typical black kid in the inner city has problems in the family, is in a dangerous neighborhood that seriously impairs his ability to go outside, let alone learn, mm -hmm. and goes to the worst schools in the country. And we're going to attribute the lack of success to genetics? It's crazy. Really, it's crazy. I think you should study it. And fine, you forget but. that they're also run by their own people. <laughs> what? I say a lot of these black kids are being destroyed in institutions run by their own people. Yeah. But they don't, we don't want to talk about that. Okay, so now we suddenly have a lot of hands up. <laughs> Let, um, who we got? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what, what you guys want to respond to. Okay, go ahead. Hi. Um, the actor and philanthropist, Till Harper, who actually graduated from Brown University. Could you, uh, I'm sorry, can, we're not hearing. Can you hear me? Yeah, Can no. you hear me? Okay. okay. The actor and philanthropist, Hill Harper, who actually graduated from Brown University, he wrote a book several years ago called The Conversation about black relationships and the black family structure and the need for it to be a part of the overall growth and, and dynamics in, the black, in black America. Um, I'd like to know your thoughts about that because it was a bestseller. It was very well researched. I read it twice. Um, but I'd love to know your thoughts about that. Anybody familiar with I don't know the book. <laughs> I'm, I'm ashamed. I'm, I'm a Brown professor. I don't know, I don't know this book. <laughs> he studied economics there. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe it was before my time. I don't want to speak out of context. I don't know exactly what I'd be responding to. So uh, I. OK. Uh, sorry. Well, we'll remember the book. For, OK, over here. Uh, my name is Ricardo Berg with the National Association of Neighborhoods. I would like the panel to address the fact that we can look at Baltimore as a success story that when the, on a night where the police withdrew from policing, there was no uprising. There was no uprising. Most black people stayed home. They did not go to the streets. A few hundred people unfortunately did, but the murder rate did not go up that night. There was generally no racial violence on a wide scale that night. So it shows that the black family is not as weak as some would like to claim because on a night where all hell could have broken loose, it did not. So maybe we are much better off than we think and others try to give us the impression that we are totally desolate of moral character. That is not true. Any response? Nope. I, I agree with that 100%. I mean, I, I think the reporting about Baltimore could be criticized from a number of different angles. I did see some stories to the effect of the mobilization of, at the grassroots level of people and of people spontaneously coming out to affirm the right, the right kind of stuff uh, there. So to think that the community is bereft of moral resources is a profound error. Uh, Bob's whole program doesn't have any traction, if that's true. And it's not true that the community is bereft of moral resources. Um, so I'll leave it at that. The real leaders come out before the rocks are thrown, not afterwards bowing down before the police, where it's safe. You have these brothers out there, the, the 100, 300 black men, they were on the scene, physically intervening. They went into a store, and, and they had their moral authority to direct these young people to leave the store and not loot it. Those are the real leaders. We have time for one more question over here. Uh, this panel is uh, discussing very personal issues. You're discussing issues related to uh, when you get married, if you should get married, uh, whether or not you should have a child out of wedlock or in wedlock. And <clears throat> to a certain extent, uh, I hear some frustration amongst the panels, uh, the, uh, the panelists, in that uh, a theme that comes out not only in this panel, but also in the previous two panels is, but it's just the right thing to do. 
but it's just the right thing to do. And I resonate with Professor Lowry's example about the candy bar, because you took us to the edge of an example and then you left it, where you, you gave us the example of a child who refuses to steal a candy bar because of social psychological or social science reasons versus I am not a thief. Right. And that begins to introduce issues of right and wrong. And I know whenever we talk about issues of right and wrong, we as academics have to defend our positions with data, and I understand that. But you're, you're coming very close to the edge, particularly with this panel of introducing issues of spirituality and religion. Correct. And I know a typical response of an academic panel is to say, yes, we need more churches to be involved in X, Y, and Z, but you're treating churches as if they serve social science. Correct. And the reality is, is that churches, particularly the Christian church, has its own agenda, and that's belief in, in Jesus Christ. And the, the secondary issue is whether or not it manifests itself in changes of, of behavior. How should we as academics and social science folks treat this issue? Is this a, a taboo issue or is this an issue that deserves a conversation among us as academics and policymakers about the, the role of the church and spirituality in terms of reversing some of these these trends, is that off limits or is that legitimate? And, it's, a, and it's a very dense question, but if we can get a quick, quick yes. response. <laughs> I think it's 80% of the effectiveness of the groups that I support are faith-centered, not necessarily church-centered. We must make, a, di make a, a, a difference. And so what we do and what we say to people, you don't have to accept the content of our faith but you should respond to the secular consequence of our faith. In my book, The Triumphs of Joseph, Pharaoh and Joseph, their relationship wasn't faith-based. Joseph was excellent in everything that he did. It was his stewardship. So I'm just saying that the change that comes about is inspired by faith in the groups that I serve, but what we're asking people to support is the secular consequence of that faith, and you can even evaluate that. Glenn, did you want to say yeah, something? Yeah, I do want to say something. I appreciate the question very yeah, much. I, you say tiptoed up to it, and actually in my own mind, I got even closer, to because when I said that the intermediating institutions can draw on sources of authority that are not available to the state, That's right. since the state can't take a position on a question of faith, I mean, we have a First Amendment to the Constitution and so forth, that's what I had in mind, mm -hmm. okay? And the, the, the mechanism that would persuade this young kid that he's not a thief, and that's not what we do, right. in the African-American cultural experience would not universally, not only, but would substantially be, predominantly it would be, a faith-based uh, set of relationships. So um, the... Uh, <laughs> After uh, the Rodney King riots in Los Angeles in uh, 1992, I published a piece in the Wall Street Journal that caused me a lot of trouble. The title was God and the Ghetto. I was a better Christian in 1992 than I am in 2015, and a more courageous one, because I don't think I would dare to try to publish such a piece, and I wonder if any op-ed page would run it today. But basically what I was saying then, and this is not about me, but I just want to put this on the table, was we can have our programs, we can have our debates, and we should study them, and we should do it. But at the end of the day, there is no substitute for reaching that place inside of a person, this spiritual yes. Yes. place inside of a person that empowers them in a way that we might not be able to forecast or imagine Amen. as social scientists. Um, I want to give Ron one last chance to say something. Uh, I, I guess I agree with the other panelists that uh, the church is a crucial part of this. And I'd be perfectly happy if people were willing to join a church and follow its precepts, incorporate it into their life, into their child rearing, into their marriages, and so forth, that I'd be happy, Bob, not to study it. To <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, well, yeah.
that is part of the problem. Values are at the heart of it. Really all right, I want to thank, thank you all thank for you. being here for, uh, really uh, for a very lively it. panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well, well. Um,